We are back. Giants baseball. Past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho, the host of the show. Timmy Haller is having some technical difficulties and should be calling in in a moment or so. Um, here he is, I'm here. Timmy Haller. Alive Hello. And well. Alive and well, Timmy. We're on the air. I just pushed the button and um, wanted to introduce you and welcome you back as the host. And um, you can introduce Patrick, who's a returning guest. Ah, yes, the great Patrick Quinlan, uh, bat boy extraordinaire uh, from uh, the North Bay area. And uh, Patrick and I, of course, know each other from years ago when he was um, working for the Giants in the Bat Boy capacity, um, and it's always great to hear from him. Welcome, Patrick. Oh, thanks for having me, Timmy. You're awesome. Thanks for having me back. Oh, uh, you're, you're going to probably become a little bit more than just coming back. You might be uh, a, a kind of a nice addition to the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, That would be terrific, Patrick. Um, Let me ask you. You were obviously a good bad boy because um, you live to tell about it. Were there bad bad boys, really bad guys that would screw up? And tell me if you guys could, in your experience in, in ball, tell me some stories about some real bad screw ups that could have been worse and weren't good um, being a bat boy. Everybody's saying, well, as a bat boy, gets to meet the players and stuff. It's a job job, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's really a, uh, it's really a serious, a serious role we play because, it, number one, it's an honored, it's an honored job, and I didn't know anybody, so I got it by just being persistent, so I, the dream happened. But, uh, you know, you just learn from being around the players. I think when I was sneaking in and going to the ballpark, you know, four years, four-plus years in a row where I was sneaking in during the summers and all those great years that uh, you got acquainted with um, the players then, and they started leaving you passes and and uh, getting early for batting practice. So you kind of – and then played a lot of ball myself. So you kind of got – acclimated um, through that experience that made the transition um, um, pretty easy for me personally because where I was from, how I was raised, and respect, and loving baseball, that you just you just knew your way around. You just uh, you just worked hard, and, and you, you got I got trained well, and follow Eddie Logan, who was my boss, the legendary equipment manager for the Giants, mm-hmm. and his father with the New York Giants. So you just there's a protocol, there's a code, there's a there's an honor, there's a respect, there's you know, you just wanna you just wanna work hard and stay busy all the time. I'll always always move. Always keep moving. Any stories of anybody not doing that as a bat boy in in your memory? Both of you guys. Yeah, you know what? Uh real quick, Timmy, the, I just remember there's there was a couple that were hired because they knew the owner and Bob Blurry and they were they were less than part time, and then I wouldn't see them. And there's got to be there's a little skill set that's involved. You got to have played some ball in your life because you're shagging out in the outfield during batting practice. So you got to have some idea about how to how to field balls from big league hitters and how to just fly balls and know where to position yourself in the outfield and just kind of know your way around and, and try not to be clumsily, cum, uh, clumsy, clumsily, you know, clumsy. And uh, <laughs> that's a, a – um, <laughs> You don't have to be articulate to be a bat boy. <laughs> yeah, you have to really be – Or a podcaster. Yeah. yeah. Right? So thank you. So anyways, you just want to – you want to, you don't want to have nerves. And uh, so a couple of the guys embarrassed themselves, I remember, where – you know they're inside the clubhouse drinking soda, eating candy, and and talking too much on the bench when the uh, when the visiting team is hitting, and um, certain things about 
not being able to shag for a full batting practice round and because uh, they're just having a tough time, you know, and they, they realized that uh, it was a little bit more than they really thought than a courtesy bat boy like the one gamer that they'll have because they want a, a, a car bat boy for the day or in spring training. You know, the, the big league season's a whole different. What was your first day like? Oh, uh, out of body. You know, when, <laughs> when, 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 when I put out the uniforms, that was one of my jobs my first year, and Eddie Logan gave me that honored responsibility from Wilson Sporting Goods that were, that was right down there on 3rd Street, um, you know, 15 minutes from the ballpark. You know, you're putting out three jersey tops for each player, three uh, uniform pants for each player in every locker, and all of them were, you know, tailored for, for – each player because of body type and, and, and whatnot. And so that process began, and then there's my uniform. So I had two tops and two bottoms. So you don't sleep that night of opening day because you just can't believe that it's coming true. You get to the ballpark, I'm there at 6 o'clock for the day game opener, last one to leave, first one there, last one to leave, and, and you're everybody's excited because everybody's 0-0, zero, zero, you know, opening day and um, – just how exciting that was to like be be on the field, be in the dugout, be exclusive access to the clubhouse, running errands for players, and it was just it was there's just it, there's hard words. It's like when players win a World Series and they they say it's it's difficult to put into words how great that is, and and being allowed and privileged. Like wait, I get to do this for the whole year, eighty one eighty one games. Okay, magical. I'm just guessing, and I've never been a bad boy. The day the team picture came out, your first year, and you were in it, that must have been some cool beans. Well, you know, I didn't think I was allowed in there. I mean, I've seen team pictures before and baseball cards. But, you know, I say they get the call to go out to the outfield to do the team picture in 76, and – so I'm, I'm just gathering all the all the equipment from batting practice to, you know, I was really, you know, tidy about that, and my timing was always right because I I just I just knew what to do there. You know, you put all the bats away, you wipe them down, you put the rosin bags in a, in a in a in a, in a certain spot with the pine tar rags and the the donuts and the leaded bats and all that stuff, and you you wipe down the the, the bench and and you put up fresh towels, get ready for game time. It's all the players, Chris Fire and Matthews and and uh, Mike Sadek, come on, Fisco, all those guys are going, come on, man, what are you doing? I go, I'm just, I'm cleaning up, man. He goes, get in the team pitcher, dude. You're in the team pitcher. <sighs> and so, I mean, all the players, and I'm going, that's, I mean, it kept on getting better. Like, each and every day was keeps adding on to the magic of this unbelievable place that you would never rather – there's no other place you would rather be, and it's your team. It's your team, and you prayed and you you wished. And being in that team pitcher, and Lo and Brow sponsored those back then, and they had the uh, team pitcher night coming up. And all my buddies were like, "Dude, you got to sign, you got to sign your photo, you got to sign the team pitcher because they had the Lo and Brow team photo night." So those I still have, of course, and uh, those are framed, and that's proof because it's proof. Too, like, right. I know you were. You know. That, so that it's was, that was a hundred percent proof. Hundred and ten percent. Let's put it that way. Because uh, we didn't have baseball cards. Now those team, exactly. So those team pitchers were in the baseball cards and tops too. So right. it's just, and I still have those and have those laminated. And sometimes I'll carry those with me when I'm out and about if I go see friends or little league games, and it's, it's just kind of cool. But I just couldn't believe that you're you're with the team. You're with the team. Now they have the front office involved, and the team pitcher consists of, you know, 60 people. And then it was just right. bat boys, manager, coaches, players. I mean, it was just awesome at the stick. I mean, it was just so rich. It was the joy and how great that was. And it was truly the best of times. That's for sure. Uh, Patrick, would you um, – and you can chip in on this to, to me. Um, one of my – best friends on Facebook, who has become one of my best friends in the world, 
is Johnny DeQuisto. And if I'm not mistaken, Johnny was still with the Giants um, that year. Any he was. You could sh- any memories you can share of uh, your interaction with Johnny? I think he's the greatest guy um, going. So um, yeah, I got his book and everything. I got to order his book, and he's. I see him a lot on Facebook too. Well, you know what? You know, he was. I knew about him because you just study, study. You know, when you're a youngster through Sporting News and you know all their books and record books and registers. You just, you know, you just find out. It's not like the internet now. We can find out anything. You know, you can find out everything. And right, but so I you, had to, you had to do some some footwork to find stuff. I mean, the different magazines, Dell Magazine, Baseball Digest would come out. Um, yeah, who's who? Oh, yeah, right, who's who in baseball? Uh, yeah. Street and Smith with the exactly. Uh, yeah, um, but it was, you know, and you're a kid, so. Seventy-five cents for Street and Smith. All that adds up when you're you're a kid. You got to spend your money carefully. Um, you know all that stuff. Um, so that transcended to um, your job with the ball club. You knew these guys. You knew of them, and uh, Johnny in particular. And so, so get to know him. They were all great because that was the era where, well, even now still, that's really a, that's really is the sanctuary and the, and the, the domain. I mean, baseball because they play so many games in six months that when you when you get established personally at, 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 in that role, you, you earn the you earn the trust with them because you try to less is more. You just pay attention, just like. When you called up to the big leagues for the first time as a player, you know, be quiet and 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 learn and learn and just be quiet and don't talk and just just try to try to learn as much as you can. And you have access to guys that have been there in the big leagues for you know years that are just veterans and Hall of Famers and All Stars and most valuable players and all that stuff. So those are the guys that really elevate and have great careers. Same thing for bat boys. So Johnny D, after like the first you know couple home stands. And you're, you're getting acquainted with every player. Well, him and Montefusco opened up a great uh, restaurant at the time. Everybody thought it was going to be great. Montefusco's Cafe, the Equistos Lounge. So you go in there for team events and all that stuff. And Johnny D was just always cool because all the guys were cool then. They were all homebred. They were all right. they were all giants through their system, through the great George Genovese and and all these great scouts that the Giants had that, uh, you know, so many guys were true Giants. And, and I remember how hard he threw. I was like, this guy, everybody's projecting to be the Knicks Nolan Ryan because he threw high 90s, you know, and uh, naturally. You know, you either, you're either gifted or, you know, you're not. But he was just always really cool with me and always kind and gracious, and it was great to know him through the years, and he played with, you know, the Padres after that in the Expos and stuff. So he tried to stay right. as in touch with those people. And then here comes Facebook. And Facebook, it's amazing how many ex-Giants and ex-MLB players during your time are on Facebook. So he was great to me and always cool and always uh, funny and always uh, included me. And I think that's the biggest honor of all is, is that players include you. Being all the pranksters about where they – go get the key to the batter's box, to go get the frozen ropes, to all the old school, uh, right. you know, enters. It's great. To, he was, so he was always kind, and I always enjoy talking with him and messaging him on Facebook. Exactly like I thought he, uh, he, he would have been back then because it just doesn't show up in life. And that's a good life's lesson that, um, you know, you go through it. You know, you're not a baseball player all your life. And you have to get by as a human being eventually. So it helps that you're a human being to begin with. So there's no <laughs> no big radical adjustment there. Um, all right. right. Timmy, would you guys go over? Um, thank you, Patrick. That's a, what a terrific insight. That's why um, you're back. And um, that's why, as Timmy says, you're such a, an addition to um, all of this. Um, 
would you guys talk about the season and what, what's led up to um, – I'm a Mets fan. I'm not as disappointed as I thought I would be. My hat uh, is off um, to uh, Bumgarner. Incredible curve, curveball. Timmy and I were talking before. It's like a Koufax curve, except it goes left to right. It doesn't go over the top. It's unhittable. And um, I'm not, you know, first time the Mets didn't score runs. I, I go, well... <laughs> You don't expect them to in a game like game like that. And um, taking nothing away from Thor, who was terrific too. Both teams, the way things were going for a while in the second half of the season, injury-wise, bad trade, good trade, this, that, and the other thing, weren't expected to be there. Um, would you guys account, talk amongst yourselves, and? Uh, account for what it is that turned them around when things were going as bad as they were? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just obviously, this is just my own opinion and kind of what I was able to visualize. Um, and and the, the Giants are, without a doubt, an enigma. They're, they are a club with incredible amount of talent with pedigree and, and the, their system and, and their history of being able to make the right deals at the right time and and then plucking these no-name players out to be such great contributors. This year, as all other years that they've had success, is one of those, you know, they're, they're, they were an enigma in 10 and 12 and 14 and they remain, they remain to be an enigma because they have a core of great star players. Right. Um, and then they add that extra piece or two to sort of just complement everything. But this year, more than ever, I, I just, they become more enigmatic and, and, and you have all these different dynamics, these different things that kind of play into it. Again, these these are just my own um, takes on things. But um, the first thing that I can't figure out, and I don't know what goes on, I don't understand it completely because I played, and I don't I don't see what I experienced as a player, and then what I see now on their on their club. But they went into a slump for like two and a half months. They couldn't score runs if they were uh, just, okay, we're going to walk everybody around the bases and give you runs. They couldn't even get to that point. And you have guys um, in that lineup that have uh, consistently over the years put up some nice numbers, like a Posey and a Belt and a, um, and a Pence when healthy. Giants just couldn't get anybody to score. They just couldn't get anybody to, to run, to to come across the plate. And then the other thing was, all of a sudden, the bullpen is um, completely unraveled. Uh, and, and I look at that as just being young and inexperienced as well. I, I think that we've got some brilliant young arms in that bullpen, but uh, they just aren't seasoned yet. They just aren't experienced enough yet. Um, you know, Strickland comes to mind. Everything he throws is flat right now. He gets it up in the zone. And these major league hitters are going to crush that stuff. Right. So how fast, the faster it comes in, the faster it goes out. Exactly. The Giants have this enigmatic thing. They can play a half of a season and be, uh, you know, 30 games over 500 and then barely squeak in at the last weekend of the season because their second half was so poor and just barely get in uh, by the hair of their chin uh, in competing with a couple of other clubs right down in the last day of the season. Um I don't, I don't know. I don't, it's like, wow, this is a mystery to me. I don't get it. I know that having my, you know, just my experience, my background, when you lose a guy like Duffy, it upsets the chemistry of the clubhouse. And that's something that Patrick can attest to. If you lose a guy like that, whether it's an injury or through trade or a transaction or something, that, you know, that's, that's got to have a big psychological effect on your club. And I think that the Giants, are, you know, evident of that. Um, 
But, I, you know, this club is one of those teams you just can't figure it out. I mean, there, there's, no either, there's no rhyme or reason to why they would be at the top of the heap one day and two months later, you know, be, you know, have won half of the games that they play uh, or have won a third of the games that they, they played. Right. It just doesn't uh, make any sense. It just doesn't, it just doesn't, it just doesn't fathom. It just doesn't come together. There's no, there's no theoretical reasoning for it. There, there's nothing to really explain it. Um, but we saw, we witnessed the season get away from them. And there's that overlooming effect on them now, even in, in, in these games. I'm watching the game tonight. There just seems to be an element, a little bit of an element of uncharity or doubt. They're they're not going out there like they have in the past and saying, we're going to win this. We're going to do this. There's that element of, of some sort of negativity or a reality, whatever you want to call it, that they just don't feel like they got the ump. And that's because of what they experienced in the second half. They realize that they are vulnerable they go through difficult periods of time, and they aren't as dominant as maybe they thought they were. That's the that's the thing about baseball. It is a very humbling sport, and it'll it'll teach you you know never get too high, never get too low. You play every day. Anybody can win, and if you have things kind of going on positively, all pistons are going. Um, there's an element of, of just the psychological side of it. The Giants, um, they're they're just not that good of a team, and a lot of it is that, you know they they do a lot of their winning by will, by just sheer self will. But this year they've demonstrated that they they there are some competition out there that um, they're better. The other teams are better, and that's okay. That's baseball. Well, I'll give the Dodgers a lot of credit. Uh, they were not expected expected to be there any more than the the Giants were. They just gelled a little bit earlier than the Giants did at the end. Um, they've got some deep down talent. Um, they're certainly not as good as the Eastern teams, as far as I can see. But first, the Giants got rid of the Mets, and now they're playing a very tough Cub team. Timmy, does Brandon Belt not – isn't he um, a microcosm of this team in terms of his up-and-down streaks? Um, he's hard. You look at his batting stance. He has a still bat, and he he looks like a hitter. I mean, you watch him, um, yet he will streak for weeks in a row both ways. And um, – I, I'm trying to get a handle on why players are. Uh, Mays was streaky, but he was never obviously he was never streaky down as long as the as uh, most players. Uh, that was Mays. It's okay to be streaky, but these streaks go on a long time with Belt. Well, yeah, I can just tell you. Well, there's only one Willie Mays, so Brandon yeah, Belt right. will never be able to uh, share the same uh, locker as Willie Mays. No, I didn't mean to make the comparison. I just meant yeah, to, yeah. to use him as an example of somebody yeah. who was great and was streaky as well. So you could accept it as long as the downs don't continue so long. Um, is there talk? Is, is there ever talk about the batting coach, the pitching coach? It, just in general, not even, you know, when teams aren't going well like this. Um, Rigetti's got a lifetime pass. Bochy can be here as long as he wants to be here. Um, no question about that. But, um, and that brings us to, to another thing. How long can a team respond to the same manager? Dusty Baker was a good example of that. He mentioned that. Sometimes you're just there too long, you lose these guys. But take it one at a time, Brandon Belt. What do you think of him? Do you think he could – I mean, he had a pretty good year overall when it came down to it, but there's a lot of ups and downs is what I'm saying. Sure, and we, we've talked about this on previous shows. He's, 
He's an enigma. He's one of those streaky players. He, you know what you're going to get with Brandon Bell. Consistently, as, as, as enigmatic as he is, he's consistently in as enigmatic. You know that. You know what you're going to get. And I think, and, and I don't know, from my perspective, we've come to that resolve that he's going to be that way, and he is our first baseman. And I want Brandon Belt to be the Giants' first baseman. I don't want anybody else to play first base for the Giants. Okay, so here's one of the things that I find glaring in the Giants' organization. Okay, they've gone through these era, times in the past where they've had uh, significant slumps at the plate. And we talked about um, Bam Bam Mullins being a topic of conversation regarding that. You know, a hitting coach and a hitting instructor, um, you know, when you're doing good, they're the greatest. When you're not doing good, they're the worst. It's just like anything, any other position, uh, I mean, in any other capacity coaching on any club. Now, Rigetti, of course, like you said, has earned that lifetime pass, and so has Bochi. Uh, because of their their history and of winning, um, there's always a little bit of uh, there will always be those undertones of talk about you know maybe we need to go in a different direction offensively with a different philosophy of hitting, et cetera. The Giants aren't always the type of club to make knee jerk kind of moves. Up until and I and I and I have to kind of underscore this up until this year. And when the the move was made to where Sabian would sit back and become a consultant and be a part of that broad scope of baseball minds, but move away from the day-to-day general manager's position and put in Bobby Evans, now we have a different personality and a different background and a different person altogether making the final decisions as far as player personnel. And I think I'm, I'm going to be candid here. I think that that's where we see some of the disruption. You know, um, I'm not well, – You know, Sabian and I, had to go up the ladder a little bit when he had a decision to make and get approval from Bear, et cetera. What leads – Well, yeah, and then eventually it was like, well, Brian Sabian's running the team, and he's putting these, these, this club together, leave it alone. And when they, they, they allowed Brian to do that, that's when they started to win. They, they really started to win when Brian got that autonomy. So and does, they, does Bobby Evans have that autonomy right now? They've given it to him this year. And I think that there's a little bit <laughs> – Hey, I'm, I'm just calling it like I see it. I, I think that there's a little bit of – there's no more of that continuity right now. It's everybody's kind of settling in to see what's going to happen and what kind of decisions he's making. And he's made some significant decisions this season. And, you know, I'm going to point it out again. The Duffy trade Duffy, was right. a bad deal, not a good thing. Not a good deal, and it won't be, and it's not going to ever be a good deal. But I'm just telling you, this is just my opinion and my opinion only. <clears throat> I don't care if we go – we don't have to win every other year. We don't have to win on, on the even years or whatever we want to conjure up in our romantic minds about winning World Series. You win World Series because you got great talent – and a, and the fluidity and a and, and a continuity of family on the club, that's why you win. Because when it comes down to the postseason, it's who's hot and how how could how good are you guys together? And you need a lot of luck. You need a lot of luck. You're going to be very good, but you got to have a lot of luck too. You're going to tell me that Baez's home run last night was. Um, yeah, the kid can hit the ball, but that thing just barely caught the net in left field, and Pagan was sitting underneath it at the 358 or 355 or whatever it is that left short, you know, left, left center field porch at Wrigley Field. You got to have those things. The baseball gods have to be on your side. That's just the plain like and the simple. Posey, the Posey uh, blast, and there you go. I, exactly, Buster crushed that ball. He squares them up, great A-B, because Buster can can hit any fastball on the planet. And it just goes to show you, because 
I know what it felt like, as we know, what it felt like when we had all those little breaks. Yeah. I mean, it just is. Just a great game. It's, it's inches, man. It is. And, and I think just uh, from an overall perspective, I think that the Giants are in, in, a, in a relative element of change right now. Um, with the Bobby Evans thing and, you know, a couple of personnel moves, et cetera, I, I just um, – you know, that is, that has a tendency to trickle down and disrupt the clubhouse. And I think we saw that this year. And I, and I think they'll be fine. I think when they report to camp next year, they're going to be a little bit better adjusted. They're going to be gelled a little bit more together. That bullpen is going to be better seasoned. Next year, that bullpen could be, you know, the Kansas City Royals of 2015 or whatever. <clears throat> In 2014, that bullpen can be incredible. They've got great arms and great abilities. But I don't think we need to go around and, and deal guys and sign free agents for a hundred plus million dollars. We need to just keep in the house and continue to work with the guys because that's where their strength is. The development and these, and the great draft picks they've taken and the, and the, the ability to, to bring guys up through their system instead of making these knee jerk sort of deals because we think that's going to make us better. And it, and it absolutely has not done that. And so they, the Giants have to learn how to kind of re-gel and re-get together and, and, and get used to this new regime of, of people making decisions. If it were me and it were my ball club, I absolutely wouldn't have that guy running my team. I wouldn't. But that's just me. <laughs> right. Well, what I like about you, Tim, is that um – so reserved about your opinions. You know? Well, thank you. <laughs> it's, hard to get, it's hard to get what you're thinking out of you. No. I would, also, I would also do this. If I were running that club, I would bring in one specific person just to handle all the bat boy duties because of his experience and beautiful ability to manage a clubhouse, and that would be Patrick Quinlan. That's one of the first uh, deals. That's one of the first things I would do. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> Can we'll uh, Can you tell us about what you're doing now? What you have a an establishment up in the North Bay? Well, me and my brother did. Uh, we had we had a we had a, just a a rockin' giant sports bar. Uh, we had a we were in the in the uh, sports bar trade for 20 years, up to about eight years ago, and uh, you know time. Uh, it was time because uh, um, everybody in, in my community, everybody has, you know, the direct TV and on Comcast now, everybody has everything they want in sports in their remote. So, you know, uh, and then coupled with a couple other things when the Niners don't win, especially if the Giants don't have good se- good years, you know, we, we, we don't do well volume-wise. So, But we had a great run, and I had a lot of my – uh, the Flatiron Building, which was on uh, Second to Be in San Rafael, is a histor- basically a historic landmark in uh, in Marin, and uh, it was established in 1883, the first year of the New York Gotham's that became the Giants in '84. It was built then, so we had, you know, I had all my memorabilia up, memorabilia up on the walls. I had a bunch of bats uh, that because I collected a lot of bats in my. Uh, in my bat boy days, and then you know sneaking in and going to the ballpark, I always collected bats, and I had a bunch of eight by ten glossies of the seventies and and some of the eighties and sixties up on the wall, and the Willie Mays wall from uh, the great photographer um, Fred Kaplan, who was a, a major league baseball photographer, Sports Illustrated, and Topps baseball card. We befriended each other, so I had all the all. It was just really thick. You walk in there, it's TVs are on. It's just Giants, 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 Niners, 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 you know, Warriors. And, uh, uh, you know, that was a great run, and uh, now it's just transition. It's uh, looking into some other stuff. I would love to get back into baseball in some area and need relations or somewhere. I don't care if it's in Kansas City or Detroit. But, uh, you know, I miss the trade. I miss, you know, we we missed the Giants World Series by two years. And I, I think had we hung tough, maybe we could have still – uh, been there because that would have been three World Series and just how competitive they've been since, you know, through right. Pac-12 being open. 
You know, so anyways, uh, I missed that because it was just the stories. Everybody wants to hear stories. Everybody's happy and positive coming in, having great food and, and you know, some beers and just talk ball. They get away from they get away from stuff, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of stuff they're managing in their lives, and sports is a salvation. And if you're a Giants fan, especially because we've been through so much pain, and then that went away, you know, because right. we three – three in a short amount of time. So, but, uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, the game, the game is so great that it's the greatest sports family there is on the planet. Nothing is like being part of that group when they accept you. And then you're on the payroll all year round. You're, you're, you're not asked back. You just, you're just always there unless right. Eddie Logan or comes from the front office. Hey, I'm sorry. We got to like, they do with the manager or coaching staff or they release a player. So that was just, uh, uh, the greatest family because everybody's so together. Everybody, it's really unique because they play so many games and you, you see everybody every day for six months. Yeah, they do the road trips, but still, um, just a great group of humans. Did you do the road just, trips? I went to San Diego and L.A. trips. And then I'd go on okay. occasionally San Diego, L.A., Houston. So, um, you know, going to uh, going on the first road trip, which was – Dodger Stadium, then San Diego, and, uh, you know, I, I just can't believe the life they live. I mean, a lot of people don't know. Nobody's really written a book about the pressures they deal with. I mean, a lot of pressures. They're like every other human being, marital marital problems, um, uh, sibling health problems, or, or uh, their spouse is, is ill. Some some of those have been documented throughout baseball that you find out more Kids, and more now because of Twitter and all the social parents. media. Yeah, I mean, they all deal with stuff. And somebody goes, oh, that guy sucks. Well, you don't know the deal. He doesn't suck. Some guys have legit bad years because that's what the Giants have suffered. The second half, you can't buy a hit. Every, they're throwing them differently. You're the mighty Giants. Everybody, everybody's going after you guys. So you learn all that psychology being in it every day because you're working with brothers and uncles and, and uh, uh, those types of bigger people like family. Which is first. Right. That's why I say it's a great family. Because it's family first. You know, everybody, you know, when we drafted Posey, I knew that process of winning was beginning because I knew all about his character and how gifted this guy was in so many areas of kindness and, and a teammate and all that stuff. Next thing you know, they build off of that to a Mad Bomb and, and, and a great manager, Bochy, and then a Belt and a Panic and a Crawford and a Pence and it goes on and on. and. Three titles. Hey, and with Posey, co- him coming back from that injury, you've got to factor that in. That is some. Well, he's banged up. Acid. He's ba- yeah, he's banged up. He doesn't have the power in him because he is sucking it up, literally. No, I mean the ankle injury when when he was put oh, into. Coming back from that, I thought he was done. Yeah, and I was at that game. I was crying. It was crushing. Yeah. There's the franchise. But we're done. We're done. Right. I mean, that's how that that's how that affects it. You lose a power everyday player, especially if that ended his career. But what it takes on his title. part to rehab, uh, the hours and hours that go into it that uh, people don't see. Well, he makes a lot of money. Hey, the pain in your body and then the, the un- uncertainty of not knowing whether or not you'll ever get get it back while you're rehabbing. That's a bitch. And it's an unbelievable recovery. Somebody should do a book on that the last, say, 20 years. How do guys come back from that? And, and right. because, because the, the training staffs and, and, and medical, current medical treatments and, and current medical rehab and therapies are so superior than it's ever been before on the planet that in sports, they're, they're – they get the best treatment. They get the best treatment humanly possible, and they're all different body types, but they're going, okay, look, we're going to tone it down. His, his comeback, that's, as, that's like Jason Kendall. That's like all these guys that came back from, from injuries across the, the board that we can recall and, and list. It's amazing. And every day these guys go through this grind, Friends of mine that play now, like Chase Utley and some other guys, when they when they're an everyday player, 
everyday player, Buster, mm-hmm. Ugly, Brandon Crawford, they're healthy about 25% of the time. That's all people need to know. They are 100% optimum about 25% of the time because all the nicks they take being a middle infielder. Everything, every time they turn weird or something, all the stuff that people don't see. When on the bases they do something, ah, there's a, there's a, a little twist there or, or, or they, they turn their knee or something. Or when they're hitting, they, they pull their hands back from 96, 98 miles an hour in on them. Nobody sees all that stuff. That's why all those guys get to the ballpark early every day to get treatment every day to get them to go full speed at the highest level on the planet, bigger, faster, stronger, all the prep that they got to pull off to play nine innings strong and hard every day. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable sport. It's unbelievable yeah. sport. What it, what it requires, you know. It gets a I bad mean, rap because people compare it to football, and they say, "Well, he's got a little hand injury." It's a skilled sport. It's not just brute. You can imagine what having a little, and I'm using the using it in quotes, a little hand injury can mean to an offense or a defensive player, just, um, just as an example. And it's not something that may put you on the DL, but you have to play through it. So it's different when two types of rehab. You're rehabbing while you're playing or you're rehabbing when you're not playing. And um, an athlete has that, that mindset, I'm sure. He doesn't want to go on the DL. Um Tell me about that. Uh, just because of their commitment. And, you know, right. back back through the through the 70s, 80s, even now, even regardless of the money, you know, sometimes there can be Jake players. And sometimes me and my buddies watch him and go, the guy's a Jake because he, he gets – but see, all that stuff, all that stuff is just – is they suck it up big time every day to pull it off, to play hard every day. Some stuff with, right. with the catchers, pitchers, every all those guys, because they're still the back of the mind. Even guys that are contracted, making 100 million in five years, that they don't want to lose their spot because there's the ego there. Numbers, right? You know, right. And they don't want to it. lose. And the track record. Next thing you know, you'll see guys that. Well, what happened to so and so? He doesn't play any day anymore. No man, he's a hanger on though. He made his money. But the last five years of his career, six years in his career, he's been on two or three teams. He's a fifth outfielder or a third catcher. The guy hits 200 all whatever happened to him. And sometimes, right. you know, sometimes they just, some will start stop working maybe a little bit harder. Or their skill, their skill set starts leaving them. I mean, sometimes I'll sit there and do searches on baseball reference of guys that whatever happened to so-and-so, you know, I'll go through the whole, all the teams. Guys are, 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 are losing the skill set at 32, 33 years old just just out of the universe. There's no explanation. Like the Giants' second half, there's no explanation. There's no there, right. You can't explain why guys aren't hit it good. And there's other – As Timmy says, there. it's an enigma. But you know what they have? Yeah, it's bizarre. They have four solid pitches, and they're built for the playoffs. So well, that's what's uh, going to be interesting Tuesday and Wednesday with Matt right. on the Matty Moore. So you come right. back in our and house. We've got Cueto coming up uh, again. Um, I think they're going to be all right. What's happening with the game tonight? Let's let's I'll be honest, you guys. The Giants are going to you guys. The Giants are going to get beat. Let's just be real about this. Let's, we can hold on to every thread and hope and be – see, that's the difference. I think this is what separates me, and I don't know about anybody else. But I, I'm, I'm not – I am a fan, but I'm not – I have a little bit I, – you know, I, I just – I want to be optimistic and I want to be happy and there's going to be butterflies and unicorns and everything else. But I, I also am a realist. The Giants don't have what it takes to win the National League pennant this year. They just don't. Unless somebody gets struck with lightning or the plane goes down on the way to San Francisco, the only way that Giants are going to win this series against the Cubs is one of those things. Let's get real. Let's just stop blowing smoke. Let's just stop doing it. 
Madison Bumgarner will probably win his start. And then the Cubs will wrap up the series. Okay, let's just, just, let's just take it for what it's worth. Because the Cubs have these guys at the prime age of their lives, they're superstars and they're stacked. And then they have a closer that comes in and throws 104 miles an hour on the average. Nobody can touch him. And th- this is just one of those things. This is probably, you know, all things lined up, the Cubs' year. And God bless them, they need to win a championship. It's been 108 years. Let it go. The Giants aren't going to win this year. That's just the way it is. And now we can sit around and, and sit around and say, oh, if the Giants do this and the Giants do that. Well, we've been doing that for the last two and a half months. And guess what? The Giants haven't been doing that. But they had uh, and I'm, a little bit at the end. They jailed a little well, bit. Well, you know, that's what is a week compared to two and a half months. Big deal. So what? They got, they got hot enough to just get squeak into the – squeak in, back in to a wild card spot. And, and we're going to expect them to win the world championship? Not even close. Let's get real here. Let's stop, you know, sugarcoating this thing. The truth of the matter is the Giants aren't that good. And you know what? I think it's good for them to step back and realize, okay, we need to do a few other things to get back to where we were because with the with the roster that they have, the bullpen that they have, some of the deals that they can't cut, get back, they have to readjust. They, they aren't as good as the Cubs. I'm sorry. And I I'm have to think out. that well, maybe – have career years. You know, everybody on the Cubs, you get to have career years. Well, you do, and and that's exactly what happened with the Giants on a couple of occasions, along with that one extra piece that I was talking about, like whether it was a Freddie Sanchez or a Marco Scudero or a Connor Gillespie or, or, you know, that one little, that one little thing, one little person that can change the complexion of a team. The Giants just don't have that mojo right now, and it's okay. We're going to survive the fact that we're not going to win this year. <clears throat> but it's going to give us the opportunity to look at the whole picture and get to where we want to be next year. You know, the, one, the, the, the most beautiful thing about baseball is, you know, we fail the vast majority of the time. Oh, and in baseball, you know, and in baseball, a team is the same way. The, the Cubs have failed for 108 years to com- to have a championship. Hmm. You know, and, and that's just the way it, it goes. The Giants went 57 years or whatever it was, or, yeah. you know, Patrick would know the, the number, before we were we even sniffed the championship. You know, and and that's just the way, that's what makes this game so wonderful and perfect is the imperfection of baseball. And baseball is the most imperfectly perfect thing I know of. Um, and well, you know, um, I'm, I hold out more optimism than you do. Obviously, I really think baseball, <laughs> we're down to eight teams. You know, this um, out of thirty, and a, you could put together a week. And what with Bumgarner being as dominating as I saw him against the Mets the other day. He can't pitch every night, Ralph. He, he can't, can't pitch every game. Guido, you yeah. Guido, you got Mike Moore. Yeah. You know, um, Matt Moore, Matt Moore, I'm sorry. Matt Moore is not an anchor in my staff. He's not going to be the number four or five starter on my team. But he is on the Giants team. Well, I, He's just not. He's so inconsistent. He's he, He's all over the place. He'll have one outstanding Hall of Fame performance and then have three really crummy performances. Now, is that what you want out of a fourth starter? No, it isn't. I'm sorry. It just doesn't. The guy just doesn't. And we will, and we we will find it out. And you know what? It's like I told everybody else, let's just wait until it happens. That's why they got to play the game. But when it doesn't, I don't want to have to say I told you so. Okay. I've been around this game, Patrick. You and I have been around this game too long. We know what happens. We know that the, 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 baseball is 90 percent um, mental. 
The other 10% is physical. The other yeah, half, as Yogi said. You've got a giant team yeah. with, anchor, with guys like Pence who have been through this playoff route of be, before having been down to the last out at times and come through. And speaking of that, Romo steps up in these last few weeks and becomes the Romo of old. Got to give him. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, but a little bit too much, too late. It's why wasn't Romo there twenty games before? Exactly. I mean, you know, here, here, you know, again, exactly. we look at we Patrick and I and some other people. We can look at a, we can look at a series or a body of games, and we can make that. We can very clearly make that assessment. What's unfortunate is that Bruce Bochy wasn't given a, a, an arm out of that bullpen, and he had to he had to try to figure it out. <clears throat> and he finally fig, figured it out by, by putting Romo in the last week of the season to hold the lead, to hold the lead to, to win a ball game. After thirty attempts, we blew thirty saves. That's thirty wins. If we can't get a closer, come on. I mean, yeah, you can't even get half of those. On the second half collapse, that could be it, the bullpen. You could well, you know, what? if we want to go around and point fingers, whatever. The, the bottom line is the Giants aren't as good as they have been, and it's okay. We don't have to win every other year. We don't have to win every year. That's all right. But the one thing I'm disappointed in is because when things weren't really going well, we didn't do make good decisions, and I mean from a personnel standpoint. The Giants have the talent. We know that. Hunter Pence right now can't hit his way out of a wet paper bag, <clears throat> and, I, and that's because, you know why? He's trying to carry that club. He's trying to do the things the other guys aren't being able to contribute. Hunter's trying to carry exactly. this team on a bad leg. Because <laughs> You can't do that. You can't expect Hunter Pence to – Pull a rabbit out of his hat. He's got, he's running on a leg, one leg. His hamstring is going to probably require some pretty significant surgery in the off season. <laughs> he's trying to hit a ball, um, you know, uh, you know, a round ball with a round bat square. He's not 100%. He's hit a hundred percent. Five run home run every t- with nobody. On. Exactly. You know, let's just, you lose all let's the just, you lost too much time. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and it's unfortunate. Same with Joe Panic. He didn't have a full season. He didn't have a full season to kind of get into that sweet Joe Panic swing. He ended up hitting two thirty nine or whatever. <clears throat> we saw him yeah. stroke that ball down the left field line tonight. That a little bit of that Joe, old Joe Panic. Let's get these guys healthy. We know we have the core of ability. We have that that really strong foundation. Let's get these young arms out of that bullpen. To come together like they're they're gonna they're going to they're just young, um, right. and let's see what happens next year. We can sit and and wish and and hope and 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 all of that, but the reality of it is the Giants just don't have that oomph. Another thing that I wanted to bring up and and Ralph, you pointed it out: eight teams in the playoffs. Eight teams, forty-five years ago. Or 50 years ago, there were eight teams in each league. That's right. Absolutely. There were eight teams in each league, and there were no playoffs. And eight clubs battled for a pennant to play the other team for a world championship. So you have the saturation of ability and talent and and crud laying all over baseball right now that guys can only play for two or three years and they blow their arms out because they they're they're trying to satisfy an organization's desire to win, which is virtually impossible to do. It's not an easy thing to win a world championship in baseball. Not an easy deal. And you got to have all the stars line up, and you got to be good, but you also have to be really lucky to make that thing come together and really come come to fruition. Um, nowadays, there's 30 clubs, um, and – you know, the, 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 the pitching, the, the level of pitching is way below. The guys that throw today couldn't have played single or double A when I played. And I can certainly tell you when my dad played, they wouldn't even, they would have been selling appliances at Sears. <laughs> you know, that's just the harsh reality. 
Um, right. And all of this emphasis is put on, you know, organizations and teams to put the best guys that they possibly can, and, and they it's just a revolving door in and out and in and out of guys that have a little bit of ability, can throw a ball 95 miles an hour for about two years, and they're done. Bring in the next guy. Bring him in. Bring him in. And we'll, we'll just – We'll just completely exhaust him. We'll give him a couple of Tommy John surgeries to see if he can capture some of that old magic that he had when he was in college with the hopes that he's going to contribute to a 25-man roster. It's a completely different ball game today. It really is. When, 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 when Patrick was working for the Giants in the late seven, in the mid and late seventies, there were guys on that roster that were that were not only good but they had grit. They when you're talking about guys like uh Ed Halicki and Al Holland and Freddie Briney, those guys came in and had the relief for four or five innings because the starter, Tom Griffin, got knocked in the left you know, into the middle of next yeah. week. And these guys would come in and Gary Pudge Lavelle, that guy, if he pitched today he would be uh, a superstar. He would be a superstar. And, mitten, and they had mitten as well. Yeah, he was unbelievable. Oh, God. You know, so, I mean, I just, I like to take this sort of, uh, the, you know, the the devil side of things, uh, the, the negative. I mean, realistically, I'm a happy, optimistic guy. <laughs> but I'm not thinking that Matt Moore is going to take me to the promised land. I, I just don't see it happening. And you know what? I'm seeing it unfold right before my eyes. And, and then there's that that vast majority of sitting over in the corner saying, oh, well, don't worry, worry we're going to win it all. We're going to still win it. Um, I'm a fan, but I'm also realistic, too. And that's just the way I feel, you know. I am equating. Well, it's just what they, the, the, the price of three championships, the price of winning three in a short amount of time. So it's strange everywhere because he is an old 35. You know, all, when you look at all those, the, the rosters and, and, you know, guys getting older and all stuff, it's it's just, this is what you pay for. You have to, yeah. when you're the Yankees, you you got to have so much talent. You know, Posey's not healthy. He doesn't have 25 bombs and 105 RBIs hitting 310. That that evens out that everybody feeds off that. and. You know, and what people don't realize, you, you win, you start getting lower and lower draft choices, and that adds up. You know, exactly. you, four or five, you, hit it you know right, what I'm bro. saying? Yep. Well, you know what, Ralph, I don't buy into the whole draft system either, because 98% of first-round picks don't even sniff double-A ball. You know, that's another crap shoot. You know, they, they're, they're, uh, what, what do you tell Mike Piazza when he's drafted in the 67 round, 62nd round? You're never going to make it. We're just, you don't tell a guy that. There's more ability and talent out of guys that sign us free agents and late draft picks in the major leagues than there are in the first eight rounds playing in the big Guys league. playing independent ball. Guys like Blevins. Exactly. And, and, um, I love those guys. Because those guys, so we can we can sit in the stands and evaluate guys all day long and say he's in the Clint Miss guy. He's going to make it. He's going to do this. <clears throat> you can't do the that last two because you can never measure a man's heart and what he has inside of him. You can't chart that. There's no stat cast for that. There's no you know. You can never ever ever evaluate a man's heart. It was in zero. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a good example of how we never know, and that's Gillespie himself. He was a first rounder. He comes back as a fill in. Um, first of all, what the ego has to adjust to along those lines, and then to come up big, even if it was against my Mets. That's all right. He's, he'll never buy a drink. He'll never buy a drink in the city of San Francisco for the rest of his life. And that's a good thing every now and again because that does prove that it isn't the su- necessarily the superstars that win it. Um, I harken back to when I was a kid, Bobby Richardson winning a, a car or a Corvette from sport because he wa- uh, had all those hits in the World Series. 
um, uh, dusty roads, you know, guys that you, you just don't expect to come up big. And uh, that's what makes it a great week. So would you do me a favor, Timmy? Keep keep a little wishing that it may happen. I mean, I know you're wishing that it may happen. I mean, keep a little optimism going because um, – they really could surprise. They could pull a couple of weeks out of their uh, derrieres. And you know, you know, there's nothing I would want more than when the Giants are down earlier in this game tonight. They're down four to two, and you got you got a guy on first. Where's that guy that unloads a shot into the left center field seats? I want that to happen, Knocked out but it doesn't. It, does, it, it, it it just doesn't happen. There's not that magic right now, and it's okay. It's all right. Um, I'm not going to get myself all twiddled up into a big ball hoping that they're going to win. I still love the Giants. If they lose, I'm going to always love the Giants. And, you know, common sense and years of being around this game tells me the Giants don't have it this year, this particular year. Did anybody think that they were going to win the world championship in 2010? Hell no. And what did they do? They brought it home. They brought it home. This could happen yet again. Yeah. If, any, if there's any manager that can do it and they can draw on it, it's guys like Wode, it's Bochy and guys that he has under him, Wotus. I mean, these guys have years of winning. They, um, they can turn a clubhouse around. Uh, they've done it before. And I'm um, just not going to give up on them. I just, um, well, I'm not giving up. Yeah, you play I, you have to play the game, but I, I'm not giving up on them. I'm just realizing maybe this isn't the time it's supposed to happen. We 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 aren't in charge of all of that. We can give Bo, Bruce Bochy the greatest roster in the world, and and then we're going to sit here and expect him to win every year. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. It does, you know, the Yankees are the greatest organization in Major League Baseball. They've won 27 championships. And they've been playing since when was their inception as a, as a, a Major League club? They've been playing for over, you know, 140 years or 120 years. Exactly. They've won 27. Yeah. Okay, so, the, the, you know, they're doing really well. They've done very well. But they don't win every year. And we can't expect the Giants to break. Yeah. No. I mean, hell, the Giants didn't win. They seem to have been doing it every other year, and this is the even year, and it could happen. Hey, gentlemen, we're up against it. Um, I love having you, Patrick. This is terrific. And um, Oh, you're kind. Thank you so much. I love Patrick is Patrick is our, our Willie McCovey to this show. You realize that, don't you? Oh. Well, I don't know if Patrick remembers. We might have talked about that the first time he was here. In 76, the Giants must have put on 11 Willie McCovey days. Do you remember? Uh, every time, Willie McCovey's anniversary of this, Willie McCovey's, uh, there was a lot of Willie McCovey's. And I was living in Sacramento, and I was working for uh, part-time a little bit for Doug Emmons of um, – of the Giants and getting bus loads of people in groups um, to get on buses to to come to to the stick in in those years and it was the oh that's year. wonderful oh I loved uh, I love doing that I have a I even he even printed me some blank baseball cards some not baseball cards but business cards with the Giants on it. Uh, and what have you, he says, take these to a printer and put your name on it or whatever, he, or a sheet of them or wh- whatever he did. So, uh, And I go go around to businesses in Sacramento. I had a sales background. And, and what is more fun and easier to sell than a day at the ballpark in a group with a group of folks that you work with to go out and sit in the sunshine? It was a little windy. In the stick, I would. Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. Um, yeah. Even day brutal. games, but it, it was brutal. But it was a day at the park, and if um, you got to appreciate that, just the smell of the grass, um, all of it. Um, 
it's visual, it's what you hear, it's what you smell, it's what you see, and um, what could be easier to sell? Um, so, <laughs> Willie, you've been struggling. If you happen to listen to any of these broadcasts, I can't think of any anybody. Timmy, over the, the months that we've been doing this together, you, there's no, nothing that makes you glow thinking about Willie McCovey. Would you tell me, Patrick, your interaction with, uh, I used to call him Mr. Mac. Um, uh, what, how did you meet him for the first time? What was that like? Well, going out to the ballpark probably when my uncle took me when I was like four years old, and then when I got older, you know, you start, you get to that age where you start remembering. It was probably when I was 10. So it was, it was MVP year. So, you know, back in the day when, when you when, when you wait to get into the ballpark, when you're a true, excited bull kid, you get a plan. And the plan is to be up there when the gates open. So you're the first one through the turnstile so you can race down to get right next to the dugout. That was my deal. So, when, and you know, after BP and just saying hello and getting those autographs, and many, because you're, you're there, what were you there, 10 times, 12 times a year, 15 times a year. And my mom got season tickets when probably about 68, 69, when she figured that was a good age to get this weekend plan and then every now and then go to a game during the week, you know, in, in, in summer and all that stuff. So seeing nice the move, Mom. Man, just, just BP, oh, beyond measure, I owe her everything. But when I got the bad boy gig in his Alabama – you know, swang, you know, swang, you'd be like, oh, there he is. And he would always say that to me every morning because he was always one of the first guys there. He was always the first guy there. That's the day game. Right. 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 There he is. Well, from that point on, just, I don't know, it's my upbringing, being around those guys earlier, going out to January uh, informal workouts where a lot of players lived in the area. So they go to the stick three times a month. So that really got me acclimated. Mays, Kenny Anderson, um, Aspire, a bunch of these guys, uh, Kevin Bass, all these different guys, uh, Gary Davenport, all these guys taught me, uh, Jim Davenport. So just being around those guys and that in the stick where there's, it wasn't in season. So that acclimated me. So knowing how to treat Mac, knowing how to, because I wasn't, a, I'm not a fan now. So to know how to, to behave. So, Next thing you know, I I, I, I I just want to position myself and be close enough to where if he needs anything, I'm there. So I became like his personal concierge, like I was to 30 of the guys, coaches and managers included. But the highlight I posted on Facebook the other day is in 1978, this is one of my highlights with Mac. In 1978, he was pursuing 500 homers, and everybody wanted him to hit it at home, but he hit it in Atlanta, Jamie Easterly, a left-hander. And... I was cruising around. I was I made use of my time during after batting practice. They have a downtime, and um, so the Puma rep, because he was a Puma guy, the Puma rep's there, and he goes, "Now look, I want to have these T-shirts." Because the Puma rep got it. He says, "Max, you're pursuing five hundred homers. What can we do for you?" Well, I want to have these T-shirts done for. I want to have these T-shirts done for all the players, coaches, managers, and right. So I went around and got the nicknames from all the players, right? And then I gave that oh, wow. list to Willie. Willie gave that list to the Puma guy, and in two weeks we got these T-shirts early in the year. Max was about four four ninety five or something, four ninety three. So all these were orange and black, orange T-shirts with black, and on the front it had 500 for 44, and then on the back it had the player's name and nickname. So you had Madlock for Mad Dog, Lavelle for Mad Pug, Moffitt for... Boogerman, uh, Johnny Lamaster, who was tall and skinny, Bones, you know, all the players had nicknames. Halicki was Ho-Ho, Montefusco was the Count, Jim Barr was JB. You know, all these players had nicknames. Minton was Evan Moon Man. Moon Man. Minton was Evan. Moon Man, right? Exactly. Mad Dog, Larry Herndon was H, uh, Terry Whitfield, T. Witt, Jack Clark, the Ripper, so on, every player. So in two weeks, here comes, here's the box in his locker. So it goes, here, Pat, tell me. Help me pass these T-shirts around. Here, give that to Sadik for Sheik. Give that to Mark Hill for Booter. You know, go around, hand most everybody. And then at the bottom of the box, 
He goes, now you didn't think I'd forget you. I'm going, what do you, you know? I'm going, what do you, I would never even say that or have that in my brain. If I lucked out, great. If I lucked out to get one of these T-shirts, because when you get it from the captain, like Stargell was great with the Pirates, when when the captain Willie Stargell, Hall of Famer, left us too, way too early, when he has these made up for the team members, especially the We Are Family Year, that's like the biggest honor. Why well, save that T-shirt? And I lost it. I knew it was around. Well, I found that like a year ago. I knew I had it. I found it in a special spot. I was looking around, looking around, looking around. And it was in a box of some other miscellaneous Giants items that I had. Well, I went and had that framed, and I posted that on Facebook. Well, McCovey was always classy to me. And then one time before the 78 season in 77, I got up the courage to ask him for a bat. Now, this is a Hall of Fame player. This is Will McCovey. I don't want to bug him. Like. I don't want to. That was, like, too personal. Like, I'm thinking that he's, he's – the bats are really prized. Like, these are Hall of Fame guys that, you know. But I had to ask. I just had to ask. And he goes, oh, is that all I, That's all you want? Right? <laughs> so he goes oh, up, wow. grabs a bat on the top of his locker, brings it down, signs it to me. That's in a sanitary, a double sanitary. You know, right. Someday I'll go and have it framed in a in a bat frame. But he was always classy. Periodically he goes, hey, you know, my people aren't coming to the game. You want to have two of your friends come to the ballpark? I'll leave you tickets. So every now and then you get that honor. But everything about McCovey is, is, is more than people could really imagine because in that setting in the clubhouse, he was, all, he was such a great person. I mean, he was just yeah. a – a quality class guy because he went about his business with no talking and no flair and he's not an emotional guy. You know, he hits a bomb. He had, you know, most grand slams. I mean, his whole career, how clutch he was. How he hit, he, he, no matter how hard guys threw or what they had, just his career. And hadn't, had he played in a place like AT&T, had he played in better weather, because at the last five years of his career, he was banged up. His legs were banged up. His feet were banged up. Mac paid the price of playing him to stick all that time because that big body of his, because he was a workout man, he loved the weights, free weight, that it took a toll on him, um, sadly, because he would have been a guy that would have had 295 with, with 590 jacks. You know, I mean, he would have even had higher escalated numbers. But he played he played hurt so much, and... You know, that was back in the day where even guys like him didn't get paid. But what a class what a classy guy and he's revered. I mean he's arguably the most popular giant by many. You know, I'm a, a nice. you know you know I, I have, have to time. I have to relate a quick baseball just as a baseball fan. I met fans yeah. specifically. I was um back visiting home in um must have been seventy eight or seventy nine and uh out at Shea and they're early, waiting for the t- team bus or the visitors. The Padres, who gets off the bus for the pa- Padres bus is Willie Davis, former Dodger, and and Willie McCovey. And they're just buddies. They're just Isn't that together. a trip? Uh, it was surreal. I mean, they didn't belong there. Exactly. <laughs> they, 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 uh, uh, you're... Everything I knew was as to be right about baseball. What the hell? <laughs> you know, what is what is this? This is wrong. Those two together. Um, it's really weird. Um, the great Willie we Davis really got, got big, big voice, big radio voice. How are you doing? How are you? That big voice yeah, Willie Davis. Right. And he and Lon just loved each other. I mean... Um, to listen to them yeah, chatter yeah. about golf, uh, um, yeah, good was, knowledge. Uh, right? Am I right? Um, good knowledge. They, good knowledge. Um, the smiles on their face. Oh, God, I miss Lon. I, miss, uh, um, I don't know who I was talking to the other days. The announcers. I. It was. It was Tally. What is this love affair like with Vin Scully? Why do people love him? He tells you a story every day. It's like you don't talk to human beings as much as you talk as you hear from baseball announcers of your team. 
and um, stories they draw on and just little nuances they make um, to the past. It's wonderful being a baseball fan. Uh, whoever you, you root for, you guys have the passion. Always will. That's what makes this terrific. I'm going to end the show and thank you for being here and tell everybody out there just to keep on keeping on. I could go on and on, man. We could go, we could go team to team and A to Z and coast oh, to coast. Oh, absolutely. And, and, who, and fought, we had so much to draw. Former Giants, where did they go? What careers they had? You talk about coaches and managers with the Giants who went That's other places. That's a great places. topic. Where are they now? Yeah, um, I love that, those segments. Yeah, um, Charlie Fox, for instance, he had a career in Montreal after that. The Irishman. A great guy. I have an interview. Like, he likes his beverage. He liked to, Pardon he me? liked to have a little something. He liked to have a little oh, something over Oh, yes. He, he was, and he'd sing. <laughs> he, was a, he had a delightful voice, and he was just uh, a fun-loving guy with great stories, and uh, as you guys are. Um have a great night, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Timmy. Thank you, buddy. Hey, hey, guys. Thanks a lot. Great show. Great show. I me. so much enjoy it. Adios, everybody. Catch you have, next have week. Have a good night. weekend. Bye-bye Bye. now. Bye-bye.